Turning Tides is an Antics Entertainment affiliate. You can find us on social media at The Turning Tides Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and at Turning Tides Pod on Twitter. For more information, or if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, please contact us at the turning tides podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Warning this episode of Turning Tides contains depictions of rape, suicide, murder, genocide, war, violence, racism, and abortion. Upon his ascent to the position of prime minister, Alcide de Gaspari was determined to stop the spread of communism in Italy, moderately increase social spending, and support church-based initiatives. He would prove to be one of the most effective Italian politicians ever, rivaling Giolitti and even Cavour in his ability to create, hold, and restructure parliamentary alliances. Di Gaspari faced many challenges in his successive governments. He had to remold a nation without employing nationalist tactics, as this would bring him dangerously close to being viewed as a fascist. For example, 1952 was the first instance in which an Italian postage stamp featured an Italian flag since World War II had ended. Di Gaspari had to amend numerous street names, stadium names, and public works plaques next. His administration changed thousands of names to more republic-friendly ones. Even more embarrassment stemmed from the national anthem, which had several replacements in the running, including Va Pensiero by Verdi, which was a song about Hebrew people who had been persecuted. It had been sung by Italian soldiers when they were hauled away to German POW camps during World War II. Considering the thousands of Jewish people who had been sent away to death camps in Italy, this song was a wildly inappropriate option. Another potential choice was the Verdi song O Signor del Tetonatio from the opera I Lombardi. This opera describes the march of northern Italians on their way to the Holy Land during the First Crusade. Again, problematic. The Hymn of Mameli was ultimately designated the Italian national anthem by default. The song asks, quote, where is victory, unquote, and in the next line answers, quote, Rome has enslaved her, unquote. The song then goes on to praise ancient Rome, asking patriots to, quote, gather as a cohort, unquote, and to don, quote, Scipio's helmet, unquote. Finally, it repeats, quote, we are ready to die, unquote, because, quote, Italy called, unquote. Set against the center-right coalition, which was led by the Christian Democrats, were the Communist and Socialist parties, as well as several dozen minority parties which ran the gamut from separatist to reactionary to anti-clerical ideologies. The Communists and Socialists gained clandestine support from the Soviet Union. In turn, Socialists and Communists exerted political pressure on the rank and file in the name of the USSR. Palmiro Togliatti, leader of the Italian Communist Party, called this approach, quote, democratic centralism, unquote. He would amend this policy even further, making reproachment between communism and the center-right possible in later years. Communists' main source of power were in their trade unions and local government, as several cities were run by communists. The socialists were led by Pietro Neni, who would likewise attempt a reconciliation with center-left forces in the 1960s. Following the harsh repression of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution by Soviet forces, the socialists became irreconcilable enemies with the communists, and factions inside their own party frayed still further. A strong man would eventually come to lead the socialists into a quote-unquote golden era, but one which was defined by corruption, 
and political patronage. De Gaspari would have a challenge before him. The fragility of the Italian government contributed to the lack of reform pushed through during this time. In the countryside, illiteracy ran rampant. Across the peninsula, many cities, towns, and villages were still bombed out wastelands, and the citizens were barely making ends meet, if at all. This is the setting of the film Bicycle Thieves, a neorealist depiction of Italy following World War II directed by Vittorio Di Sica. It tells the story of a father who has his bicycle, which is his only method of procuring work, stolen. This event upends his entire life and livelihood as he attempts to find his bicycle. It is a tragic story of loss and desperation, told through the eyes of a father, his wife, and their young son. The effects of the Allied bombing campaigns were still visible, during production for the film. The head of state of the New Republic was Luigi Ionaudi. Prior to being chosen as president, Ionaudi was the governor of the Bank of Italy. With this background in high finance, Ionaudi proved to be the perfect man for the job when it came to balancing the budget and bringing about a quote-unquote economic miracle for Italy. Ionaudi believed that nations needed financial freedom, and he pursued this belief to a fault, doing all he could to drag Italy out of debt while trying to prevent an inflation crisis. His economic policy caused the delay of many construction projects as well as increased unemployment, but he also halted inflation and kept the lire afloat. He accepted massive amounts of money from America through the Marshall Program, these funds were then distributed to the public to prevent social unrest. Ionaudi was one of the first leaders to advocate for a, quote, federal Europe, unquote, which would facilitate more streamlined trade, travel, and commerce between member states. This was a precursor to the modern-day European Union. Another boon for the Italian state was the discovery of natural gas reserves in Lombardy. This made Italian energy easier to produce, causing the energy sector to be less reliant on foreign imported oil and coal. Mussolini's fascist regime failed to discover these vast fields, as well as vast tracts of oil reserves in Libya. Dennis Mack Smith contends, quote, this is a pertinent commentary on the self-justifying boastfulness of the fascist regime. Unquote. In Sicily, Enrico Mattai was successful in drilling for oil. Prior to his untimely death, Mattai was pumping out 7 million cubic meters of oil and natural gas across Italy. He used his profits and fabricated numbers to justify his monopolization of Italian oil and gas. Parliament was complicit, and with his newfound profits, he expanded into chemicals, cement, tourism, and textiles. He gave generously to all political parties, and they usually looked the other way when confronted with facts regarding his financial misdeeds. Italy was now an industrial haven with a massive pool of reserve labor, which kept wages low. This labor was mostly from the south. As we discussed in episode 3, southerners were forced to move north as immigration was being curtailed in more developed countries. Mussolini attempted to stop this, requiring workers who moved to the city to have found a job first. Now, impediments to city migration were removed. Millions moved to the north of Italy, as well as other European countries. The second migration wave is rarely talked about, but it was just as significant, if not more so, than the first. Amongst the millions were Minonina and Nono, who migrated from Sicily. Their homeland was undergoing severe hardships and economic changes. The once prosperous sulfur mining towns of the interior of the island were closing their doors, as the mine's resources were exhausted 
and operators received backlash from environmentalist groups. The Mafia, which had grown to new heights in World War II, was now a rampant menace, which exacted retribution on their quote-unquote enemies, sold drugs, and used their money to sway corrupt officials. They had no gripes about killing police, politicians, or their families. Sicily and Sardinia were two regions of the country which enjoyed a form of autonomy under the new constitution. However, this did little to curtail corruption. In regards to the mafia, many Sicilian politicians, policemen, and judges worked with La Cosa Nostra rather than attempt to stop the shadowy organization. These individuals knew what could happen if they attempted to stop their activities. As a result, the Mafia became even more deeply entrenched in Italian political and social life. All over the country, political jobism and patronage were the orders of the day. Christian Democrats, alongside the Socialists, used their positions in the party to gain lucrative posts in state-run industries and institutions. From the highest forms of government to the lowest civil service position, the Italian state was swamped with corrupt politicians who gained their position by knowing a guy who knows a guy. Both sides used their positions to their advantage as well as to the advantage of their friends whom they put in office on a whim. Catholic action had ballooned in membership to over two million individuals and they worked diligently to support and bolster the Christian Democrats. Communists and socialists, meanwhile, used the vast network of labor unions and labor federations to control membership and dole out rewards to loyal supplicants. Besides the enclaves in the north and center, the left of Italy faced an extreme challenge in the form of American-style consumerism. American design, fashion, aesthetic, politics, and culture were influencing Italians. Christopher Duggan says the country of the film Bicycle Thieves was quickly being replaced by the, quote, country of Federico Fellini's La Dolce Vita, 1960, unquote. Consumerism proved unable to fix the geographic divide between the North and the South, and in many cases it perpetuated the issues both regions faced. Capital was increasingly invested in the North in order to improve existing industries, while the South remained rural, poor, and overtaxed. Di Gaspari knew the situation between the North and South was deteriorating due to his policy, but he was either incapable or too passive to stop it. If he wanted to keep the majority he had intact, he had to allow Italian politicians to boast about economic growth, while they undermined the same growth with their corruption. The situation would prove disastrous to the post-war political parties of Italy in due time. For now, schemes were hatched which could potentially correct the situation in the South without the government having to be too hands-on. The Italian government allocated vast sums of money to the South in order to build roads, water networks, and schools. But approximately one-third of all the money ended up in the hands of the Mafia or the Comora. Overall, living standards increased, but they only did so at a high cost. Some private institutions moved factories to the South, but overwhelmingly, it was state-run industries which moved south, thus increasing political corruption, which was already widespread. In 1950, the most ambitious plan was hatched by de Gaspari's government. He wished to quote-unquote reallocate vast swathes of southern land into the hands of the peasant class. This proposal was met with serious opposition from southern landlords, who enjoyed a feudal-like existence with their tenants. This opposition was not enough to keep the proposal from being enacted. Unfortunately, the few peasants who benefited from the land grants were unable to keep up with payments, and many defaulted on their startup farms. Regardless, the reforms had a real impact on the lives of Italians. 
Following the war, Christopher Duggan says real wages of Italians had cascaded to half of what they were in 1938, while the average daily calorie count for Italians was just 2,100. Only half of all Italians had a kitchen in their home, while only a privileged 27% could say they had a bathroom. When it came to running water and electricity, only 7% of all Italians could claim this luxury. One of the most common forms of transportation was the bicycle, until the release of the Vespa scooter. Up to that point, the average worker could not afford motorized private transportation. The slogan, Vespa e Liberty, was more than good advertising. It was the truth. Throughout the 1950s into the 1960s, Italy experienced economic growth, which was second only to Japan. Italian companies excelled in making a variety of products, not just cars and tires, but now home appliances and washing machines. Italian governments under Di Gaspari endeavored to capitalize on this burgeoning success. In 1952, they joined NATO, and in 1957, Italy became a founding member of the European Defense Community Plan with their signing of the Treaty of Rome. Exports increased significantly to European neighbor states as a result. By 1960, over 40% of Italian exports went to these countries. Successive Christian democratic governments may have been liberal in terms of economic policy, but their social and cultural policies were anything but. Politicians endeavored to censor that which went against Roman Catholic teachings. This occurred in television, where the state-run RAI's mission statement was to prohibit that which might undermine, quote, the sanctity of the matrimonial bonds, unquote. Besides TV, journalism was heavily scrutinized. References to sex and violence were usually censored by state entities. Instead of referring to the act of taking one's own life as suicide, they referred to it as a, quote, insane gesture, unquote. Abortion was replaced with a, quote, interruption of maternity, unquote. Now, a couple did not engage in coitus. They were experiencing, quote, sentimental expansiveness, unquote. In 1956, the head of the RAI would have to resign after he allowed a broadcast of a ballerina troupe performing in tights which matched their skin tone to air. It supposedly caused the Pope to hurriedly turn off his television and pray for several hours. For what? Who can say? This doctoring of language went on until the late 1970s, and the Christian Democrats remained in power until the 1990s, largely due to women's votes. As the 1950s progressed, it became clear there were several problems with the new constitution. The executive branch of government now wielded very little authority in the hopes that this would deter any future leader of the country from becoming a dictator. Instead, it created a squabbling horde of parliamentarians who held power but were unwilling to govern. They belonged to a litany of parties and any attempt to reform Italy was invariably met with intense opposition. Prime ministers became their coalition's diplomats, attempting to mend rifts between the disparate alliances they had formed, instead of attempting to build support for new legislation. The heads of these parties, who were known as secretariats, gained enormous political power and wealth because of their positions. A head of a major party had the potential to collapse the government by withdrawing their support for the party currently in charge. As a result, only two out of 27 post-war governments ended in a vote of no confidence against the sitting prime minister. Everyone else resigned of their own volition. President Inaudi and Di Gaspari would have preferred a first-past-the-post form of elections, reducing the number of parties and consolidating power into the hands of a few major parties only. 
This would have greatly strengthened the central government, but it also would have excluded many smaller parties, which would negatively impact voters, as is exemplified today by America. There were similar constitutional problems in other areas as well. Article 7 claims Roman Catholicism is the state religion, while the very next article claims all religions are legally equal. This is contradicted yet again as divorce, birth control, and abortion were all controlled by Catholic sentiments in Italy. Pope Pius XII continuously pressured Christian Democrats into maintaining these same patriarchal institutions. In 1949, Pope Pius XII excommunicated millions of Italian voters simply for voting for the Communist Party. Di Gaspari did all he could to appease the Supreme Legate. Dennis Mack Smith says, quote, Where articles of the Constitution seem to conflict, he would give the Church the benefit of the doubt, even allow the bishops some immunity from legal sanction, unquote. However, Di Gaspari attempted to stray from the Church as well. He repeatedly criticized Catholic action and was against clerical influence in politics. In one notable moment, the Church demanded Di Gaspari seek an alliance with neo-fascists, but he refused their entreaties. This proved pivotal in the 1953 election, which was incredibly perilous for Christian democratic hegemony. Following this closely run election, Di Gaspari called for a radical change in how elections were tallied in Italy. He proposed that any party which received a clear majority should be given an extra 15% of the allocated parliamentary seats. It was a bridge too far, and violence erupted on the floor of Parliament on numerous occasions, the likes of which hadn't been witnessed since Mussolini's black shirts ran rampant. His proposal was adopted, but come election time, the Christian Democrats failed to reach the required 50% of the popular vote. This move effectively ended de Gaspari's career in Parliament, and Christian Democratic hopes were at an ebb. Their fortunes would continue this slow decline for 40 years, until the party was eventually dissolved. In 1955, it came time to choose a new head of state. Replacing Ainaudi was Giovanni Granci, an incredibly conservative figure who entered politics as a part of Mussolini's regime. What followed were several successive governments, lasting only a few months each. Replacing Granci as president in 1962 was the ailing Antonio Segni. Segni resigned due to his poor health and was replaced by the social democrat Giuseppe Saragat in 1964. 1961 marked the 100-year anniversary of the Italian Risorgimento. It would also mark the end of a period of relative economic stability in the country. Alongside the ebb in economic fortunes, political radicalism was creeping back into Italian politics. The neo-fascist Italian Social Movement, or MSI, was gathering steam throughout the country and its militants were being energized into violent action. The Radical Party was experiencing a rebirth as well. It was anti-communist but also anti-monopolist. Their members wanted to bring back the ideas of Mazziniism to modern Italy. Meanwhile, the socialists were maintaining a sizable minority in parliament. The ruling Christian Democrats were putting out feelers toward this party, in the hopes of pushing the country toward a left-center welfare state. One of the leading voices for this push was Aldo Moro, soon to be prime minister. Unfortunately, corruption, alongside the mending of relations with the socialists, caused many upper-class Italians to withdraw hundreds of millions of lire from Italian banks and deposit their money in foreign banks instead. This helped precipitate a collapse in the Italian stock market as well as a countrywide recession. In reality, this recession was a natural byproduct of the successes of the 1950s. The quote-unquote economic miracle was short-lived, and Italy was stagnant once more. 
Within the government, the most radical socialists broke away and formed their own party. Moro was attempting to hold together this fragile coalition. He went on to be named prime minister in five separate elections. Moro half-heartedly attempted to fix many of the country's woes. He set up a commission to deal with the mafia. However, this proved a failure, as many politicians were openly working to subvert the commission's report. In spite of this failing, Italians had a better standard of living than ever before. Illiteracy reached all-time lows. More people were speaking the Italian language as opposed to their local dialects. This was largely due to television. Italy allowed clientelism to permeate their government even further, letting organized interest groups essentially run the show. Moro, however, proved adept at managing these groups, which sought to gain political power through nefarious dealings. In 1967, it was discovered that a military coup had nearly upended the country three years previous. Apparently, the state police and military leaders had been collecting dossiers on over 150,000 Italian citizens. Many of these were prominent figures in society and politics. If the coup was successful, the island of Sardinia would have been converted into a massive political asylum for these citizens, while Italy would become an ultra-nationalist Catholic dictatorship. This coup was supported by an organization which was even shadier than the Italian state police. Gladio was a UN-funded secret organization. They mirrored the stay-behind parties of World War II, only this time the targets weren't fascists but left-wing dissidents. Members of Gladio would so dissent infiltrate left-wing organizations, and even carry out terrorist attacks, which they would then pin on the left. Its existence would remain a secret to the Italian parliament for 40 years. It is likely Gladio was instrumental in orchestrating the attempted coup and countless terrorist attacks to come. The results of the election of 1968 reflected the country's fear of authoritarianism as well as the disappointment felt over Moro's failed center-left experiment. Left-wing, anti-government forces gained significant ground in comparison to the faltering Socialist Party. Plagued by recession and a burgeoning far-right militant movement, the center-left could only push for half-hearted reforms one of which was a massive economic aid package for the south of Italy. Unfortunately, numerous economic problems, corruption, and natural disasters impeded much of the funding, and the funding which did reach the south found its way into the pockets of gangsters and the politicians who were on their payroll. The end of Moro's first round of premierships signaled the start of the years of lead. It was a time in Italian history when democratic reform would be discarded and extremists would engage in horrifying terrorist attacks, which killed hundreds of people, wounded many more, and caused billions of dollars in damage. Across Europe and the world, similar scenes were playing themselves out as students, intellectuals, and would-be revolutionaries took matters into their own hands. These attacks had no one clear motive— some were politically based attacks, others were nationalist and separatist in nature. Whether it was the Basque country in Spain, French officers in Algeria, or German speakers in the Alto Adige, these violence-prone individuals were prevalent. In Italy's case, left-wing extremists were overwhelmingly persecuted by the state, regardless of their involvement or lack thereof. By 1981, tens of thousands of leftists would be arrested, and several would be killed by police. On the other hand, a dozen or so fascists would face the same punishment. It began with mass demonstrations at universities across the country. The next year, there were violent disputes and several labor actions. In December, a massive bomb exploded in Milan, killing 16 people and wounding many more. Authorities quickly accused leftists of planting the bomb, but it was uncovered that the culprits were likely neo-fascists. The investigation was further botched when relevant evidence was purposely neglected by investigators as it would have exonerated the leftists they wished to prosecute. 
There were examples of political terrorism in Italy prior to this bombing, mostly in the German-speaking North and in the South, where banditry was still prevalent. But the 1969 Piazza Fontana bombing would begin 20 years of violent turmoil. In 1970, the left would rally their own violent forces against the state. The most famous of these terrorist groups were the Brigata Rossa, or the Red Brigade. Their objective was to destabilize and educate the masses through terrorist attacks on state figures and leaders. Their right-wing counterparts believed in indiscriminate attacks against civilian targets or left-wing agitators. They attempted coups, derailed trains, and killed armed forces members. Additionally, in 1970, the Italian parliament finally legalized divorce. Alongside this, birth rates were falling in Italy pointing to an increase in the use of contraception and the secularization of society. Hard-right parliamentarians grumbled enough to get the issue of divorce and abortion on a ballot in the form of a national referendum. 88% of the Italian electorate voted, and almost 60% of them supported the right to a divorce as state law. It was an utter rebuff to the hard-right. In 1978, Abortion would finally become legalized across Italy as well. In 1981, this decision was overwhelmingly supported by the Italian people, with only 33% of the country voting no on the abortion question. Back in 1970, regional administrations were finally set up in many Italian municipalities. This truly decentralized the government for the first time, but it had as many shortcomings as a highly centralized state and did nothing to counteract the rampant corruption in politics and state-run industries. Parliament still ran poorly and few reforms were initiated. Decrees from the president were often reissued whenever parliament failed to approve their laws, making parliamentary democracy little more than a farce in Italy. It seemed the only thing which kept the Christian Democrats in power was Italian voters' absolute aversion to communism and socialism. These two ideologies never enjoyed serious mass support from the Italian people, only finding isolated pockets of popularity in the industrial north and the highly radical center. They were helped in their objective by the Soviet state, which regularly perpetrated atrocities against fellow socialist countries. In Hungary, they killed thousands who dared to reform socialism, while in Czechoslovakia they overthrew the popular government, which was calling for, quote, socialism with a human face, unquote. In the mid-1970s, Italian communism fell under the sway of Enrico Berlingue. He attempted to reach a, quote, historic compromise, unquote, with the liberal parties of Italy in the hopes of making communism a viable coalition candidate in the future. This policy paid off, and in 1975, communists swept many local elections throughout the cities of Italy. This caused a serious reaction amongst traditionally conservative voters. Come the following year, Christian Democratic supporters rallied. Gladio operatives gave generously to neo-fascist organizations in order to keep communism from becoming too popular with the Italian citizenry. Around the same time, the first of many scandals was unveiled to the nation. Investigators had revealed that the American company Lockheed Martin was bribing Italian officials in order to sell their Hercules airplanes. The head of state was implicated in the scandal and forced to resign. Once again, Aldo Moro was the prime minister. Following his ousting in 1976, a, quote, national solidarity, unquote, government was instituted by center and communist parties, but headed by Christian Democrats once more. This whole time, left, right, and mafia-based violence continued unabated. In 1978, the former prime minister, Aldo Moro, was kidnapped by Brigata Rossa members after his bodyguards were killed in an ambush. Police and security officials failed to locate Moro and failed to negotiate on his behalf. After two months in captivity, Moro was executed and his body was left in the trunk of a car for police to discover. This killing sent shockwaves all across Italy. 
Police and Secret Service forces were mobilized like never before to crack down on left-wing subversives. In 1980, the Bologna Central Railway Station was bombed by right-wing extremists, killing 81 people and wounding hundreds of others. To this day, many far-right figures claim this attack was the work of the Palestinian Liberation Front, but these claims have no tangible evidence backing them. In the south of Italy, gang and mafia influence were reaching new heights of power and violence. They committed numerous bombings, shootings, and robberies all across the countryside. In 1981, there were attempts to finally fix the situation for good. A comprehensive witness protection program called on former mafioso to become state evidence. In no time at all, hundreds of pentiti were outing their former crime family members. This program began with the hopes of curtailing an increasingly violent mafia clan war, which was claiming numerous lives all across Sicily. Dalla Chiesa was sent there to lead a counterinsurgency force against the mafia. In 1982, he and his wife were killed by hitmen, who had information only people close to Chiesa would know. His brother-in-law shouted at their funeral, quote, You have murdered them in Parliament, unquote. In 1984, Tommaso Buscetta, a notorious crime boss, came forward as a pentiti. He was one of the first to outline the complex web of organizations and families which made up La Cosa Nostra, or This Thing of Ours. Thanks to his information, 344 mafioso were sentenced to jail time. As the 1980s progressed, world economic patterns were trending up once more. This did nothing to curtail corruption in Italy. Politicians were supposedly in the pockets of big oil. Journalists who claimed to have evidence mysteriously disappeared. In the steel industry, state-subsidized IRI was becoming increasingly inefficient, as well as a home for patron seekers. Besides steel, IRI controlled airlines, shipbuilding, and automobile factories. This state entity was surpassed in corruption by several private individuals. Michel Sindona was a southern Italian financial guru. He quickly became involved with the mafia and in drug smuggling. He paid lavishly for protection, while those who investigated him found themselves dead. After finally being prosecuted, Sindona was found dead in prison from cyanide poisoning. Roberto Calvi was another example. He was the head of the largest private bank in Italy. He used his financial leverage to gain political support and favors. After being accused of embezzlement and tax fraud, he fled Rome for London. In a matter of days, Calvi's body was found dangling from the Blackfriars Bridge in an apparent suicide. One thing which linked these two people together was the P2 Masonic Lodge. P2 was a highly secretive organization which, while masquerading as a Masonic Lodge, took part in clandestine operations against quote-unquote left-wing extremism. They have been accused of funding terrorists, laundering money for the mafia, and gun-running for right-wing extremists. The secret society contained members of the upper echelon of Italian politics, industry, and high finance. With that in mind, it's little wonder the government attempted to cover up P2's existence. Dennis Mack Smith contends that the ultimate goal of this secret society would be to, quote, introduce a more authoritarian form of government, unquote. In addition to these scandals, natural disasters rocked Italy throughout this period. In 1980, a massive earthquake struck just south of Naples. It caused utter devastation, killing over 6,000 people. Millions in donations were redirected into the hands of local gangs, preventing adequate rebuilding of affected villages, while further widening the economic gap between northern and southern Italy. 
Red Brigade members kidnapped the Christian Democrat who was in charge of relief efforts. And in a telling scene, Italian officials negotiated with these terrorists, rather than allow any unsavory details to emerge about their own complicity. Thankfully, not all the news out of Italy was this disheartening. Another economic miracle was in the works as several changes to state policy opened the gateway to private investment. In 1976, RAI's monopoly of broadcasting had come to an end, and new competitors entered the fray. Amongst them was Silvio Berlusconi. Originally a real estate tycoon, he used his political connections and less-than-legal methods to create a broadcasting empire. By 1980, 44% of Italian eyes were glued to his TV channels. Firms found new sources of income through outsourcing labor to smaller mom-and-pop shops. As a result, over 60% of the Italian population had work in firms with fewer than 100 employees. These big firms also increasingly turned to migrant labor from the Balkans and North Africa. This unleashed a new wave of racism against these peoples. Estimated at over 2 million, these migrants lived and worked in appalling conditions across Italy, but mostly in the country's industrial north. Once again, this quote-unquote miracle was built on a lie. But for now, many entrepreneurs achieved success, as Italy was allowed entrance into the European economic community. This propelled Italy into a place of economic progress never before and not since witnessed by the country. For a brief few years, Italy surpassed Great Britain as the fifth largest economy in the world, although Great Britain attempted to dispute this fact for a long time. In the 1983 elections, Bettino Craxi would become Italy's first socialist prime minister. To say the Socialist Party had gone through a change since its inception would be an understatement. For decades, the party had been openly hypocritical, preaching about the working man's plight while driving off in a Lamborghini. Once placed in power, quote-unquote socialists proved to be socialists, but for the entirely wrong class. Craxi had been building an empire of political patronage for years, largely with the support of his longtime friend Silvio Berlusconi. These big business socialists under Craxi proved very effective at holding together a coalition, as Craxi would rule as prime minister for five years. He would be dealing with new forces in Italy, amongst them a burgeoning environmental movement and the Green Party which supported it, the Libertarian Radical Party, and an early feminist movement. Craxi seemed unwilling to help the South and was much more focused on controlling machine politics from his base in Milan. As a result, a senior judge in the South claimed the Mafia and similar organizations had, quote, absolute control, unquote. Regardless, it was clear Craxi was a master web weaver. He sought to empower the prime minister with more prerogatives, in the hopes of making government in Italy last longer than their less-than-a-year average. He faced additional backlash for attempting to rework the way elections were run, as many still preferred the proportional style currently in place, as opposed to the first-past-the-post system. Following Craxi's rule of complicit corruption, three weak Christian Democrats were in office. This is when the wheels began to fall off the wagon that was the Italian state. There had been rumors and whispers for some time about massive corruption rings inside Italian party politics. Supposedly, Christian Democrats were accepting massive bribes for lucrative prison contracts. Before the scandal of Bribesville could truly break, the USSR fell apart after a massive campaign of civil disobedience erupted into a series of political revolutions in many Soviet satellite states. As communism fell, the Communist Party of Italy sought to rebrand. The communists had been seriously suffering in recent elections, as their name was tarnished by the Soviet state's misdeeds. They transformed themselves into the Democratic Party of the Left, or the PDS. 
while a small militant offshoot of the party became the party of a communist refoundation. The Christian Democrats had lost their single most powerful tool in preserving their base of power. Deprived of communist bashing, the Christian Democrats were rapidly fading in relevance. In the South, an anti-mafia party called The Network was demanding reform against the corrupt government and complacent politicians. In the North, Umberto Bossi was creating the Northern League, a party dedicated to anti-immigration sentiment, as well as the eventual separation of Northern Italy, Padania, from the rest of the country. Bossi argues that the center and south of Italy are economically holding back the North, while also siphoning away Northern resources and capital in the form of welfare. In 1990, The first revelations of Gladio were uncovered by an enterprising Venetian magistrate. He discovered that the sitting president, Francesco Cosiga, had helped to set up Gladio and used it to funnel weapons and intel to far-right militant movements. The president claimed state secrecy and immunity and refused to testify regarding his involvement. He took it a step further, attempting to empower himself with more executive prerogatives. Those that disagreed with Cosiga were lambasted in the press, but a general movement to impeach the president began. In 1992, Cosiga prematurely dissolved parliament. Investigations were ramping up against many well-known Italian politicians everywhere. The coming elections could save their necks if they won enough popular support. Otherwise, many would be prosecuted. Their nefarious scheming might have worked, were it not for the boneheadedness of Mario Chiesa. Chiesa was a small figure in a long line of political patronage which ran all the way to the former Prime Minister Craxi. The nursing home he operated, along with his other businesses, was scoured and the residents were made to vote for the Socialist Party. The owner of a small cleaning company, became fed up with having to pay Chiesa 10% for the exclusive contract to his nursing home. Chiesa was accused and tracked down. He was found attempting to flush 30 million lire down the toilet. Faith in the old post-war parties was clearly being shaken. The socialists and Christian Democrats in Italy had barely any support now, while the former communists were still attempting to pick up the pieces. This led to the resurgence of anti-democratic right-wing parties. The Northern League would win almost 50 seats in Parliament. While on the left, the Green Party was represented, along with several smaller parties, while the anti-mafia network won several seats as well. It was clearly the end of an era in Italian history. And many historians consider this the end of the First Republic. Italy was irrevocably different from the land Mussolini had ravaged during the Second World War. More people spoke Italian and identified with Italy as their homeland than ever before, but many of the same problems affected the country in seemingly insurmountable ways. The price of progress was steep, and the miracles which Italian politicians boasted about were fleeting. In reality, both economic miracles were based on lies. The first was only necessary and possible because the people who were in power had destroyed Italy in the first place. The second miracle was brought about by a small business class which regularly evaded taxes. State expenditure and debt had gone up astronomically, while in many areas people relied heavily on government assistance to support themselves and their families. Attempting to fix Italy's economic woes, the Maastricht Treaty was signed in 1992. This treaty endeavored to correct many of the inefficiencies in the Italian economy and bring it more in line with European standards. This treaty did little to hold back the floodgates of scandal. The elections of 1992 produced no clear majority and it took weeks to find a willing prime minister. Giuliano Amato was dropped into power amidst the worst of the Bribesville scandal. 
In countless cases, Italy's most prominent politicians were accused of accepting massive bribes or doling out political favors to their supporters. These politicians were often incredulous in the face of evidence, and few would face serious punishment as many claimed innocence and were given immunity from charges. In Sicily, the latest effort to curtail the mafia was met with more violence, as mafia hitmen killed two magistrates investigating their organization in two separate bombing attacks. So many had died and so many families had been ripped apart. There was now an active campaign across all of Italy against the mafia. Accused and forced to acknowledge his guilt, Craxi was seemingly in for it. However... Parliament conspired to prevent his prosecution. Dozens of trials were lined up for many of the most powerful in Italy in spite of this dishonorable reprieve for Craxi. Alongside arrests, there were dozens of suicides of those accused of corruption. Free of much of the stigma around corruption, the former communists were not hurt by the Bribesville scandal, but they received little new support. Extremist right-wing parties were finding surging success, but they were often at odds with each other. In the South, the neo-fascist MSI had strong support. Because of this fact, the MSI supported social spending on welfare. The opposite was the case with the Northern League, who threatened secession if welfare spending continued to hurt the North. This difference of opinion would ruin many right-wing coalitions in the new century. In 1991, a moderate faction inside the MSI succeeded in taking over the party. They practiced a policy of insertionism with center-right governments. This led to their rise throughout the 2000s and 2010s, as well as their heading of the Italian government in 2022 under a new name. In 1994, the Christian Democrats broke into two segments never to be as powerful as they once were. Silvio Berlusconi's brother was accused of corruption and inquiries were made into Silvio's financial dealings. He decided the best way to avoid charges was to become prime minister of the country. He used his television channels to support his own campaign. In January, he announced his candidacy, saying, quote, If the political system is to work... It is essential that there emerges a pole of liberty in opposition to the left-wing cartel, a pole which is capable of attracting to it the best of an Italy which is honest, reasonable, modern. Around this pole, there must gather all those forces which make reference to the fundamental principles of Western democracies. In the first place, the Catholic world, which has contributed generously to the last 50 years of our history, as a united nation. I tell you that we can. I tell you that we must create for ourselves and for our children a new Italian miracle. Unquote. How Berlusconi would bring about this miracle, he failed to mention. His new political party, Forza Italia, was as generic as his pitch to the Italian people. In essence, he made the same pitch Christian Democrats had made since they first took power in 1947, which was, left-wing bad, so vote for me. Berlusconi would cruise to power as part of a coalition which consisted of the Northern League and the National Alliance, which was the rebranded neo-fascist MSI. Berlusconi's first government proved he was incapable of delivering a new miracle to Italy. He spent much of the time attempting to mend the many issues within his own coalition before his fragile majority gave way, and new elections were called for in 1996. In the end, a center-left alliance, led by a new-look democratic socialist party, under the leadership of Romano Prodi, won a slim majority in both houses. He would be prime minister for two years until his communist reform allies withdrew their support. He would return to Italian politics following a stint as president of the European Commission, where he would serve as prime minister once more in 2005 and 2006. Following the 1996 victory of the center-left, Italian politics would fall into the control of the center-left for many years. In mid-2001, however, Berlusconi would return to power and rule for almost five years. 
During this time, he deployed thousands of troops to Iraq in Operation Ancient Babylon, in which 16 Italian soldiers died. Following Berlusconi's second term as prime minister, Italian politics stabilized in a serious way. Governments lasted for a longer average than in the 50 years previous. This stability was sadly fleeting. Issues with immigration, internal politics, and the economic situation across the globe were coming to a head, leading to something altogether different and highly disturbing. So the question remains, how exactly did a small, extreme, right-wing party, which could rarely agree with itself on many issues, suddenly become the head of a right-wing coalition? David Broder explores this question in Mussolini's grandchildren. At first, neo-fascists went about altering history. In the previous episode, we discussed the Foiba massacres, which occurred on the border of Italy in what was then Yugoslavia. Following the war, the remembrance of these massacre sites became an important part of early neo-fascist publicity. They did this to show that there were actually, quote, bad people on both sides of the fighting, unquote, just like there were, quote, good fascists, unquote. They turned the questionable border situation with Yugoslavia into a rallying cry for nationalists all over Italy. This trend continues through today. Somehow, in 2017, Trieste, of all places, was named, quote, the most Italian of all cities, unquote. The atrocities committed against Slavic peoples were quickly brushed aside. This was, quote, ancient history, unquote. But the Foyd massacres were different somehow. Likewise, they shied away from the racist rhetoric of Mussolini's Salo regime. David Broder says, quote, The fight is not posed in terms of biological racism, but of ideology and culture, unquote. This makes it easier for modern fascists to claim plausible deniability when they are called racist pigs. They omit racist language and instead use their rhetoric to paint themselves as victims. Now, if someone calls you a xenophobic racist, you can reply that you're just, quote, worried about an attack against your homeland, unquote. And that's why you don't want other cultures, races, or religions to infiltrate the country. They claim that the Great Replacement and quote-unquote reverse colonialism are preventing them from flourishing and is hurting their culture. Modern-day Italian fascists claim that they are being persecuted in a way that is similar to how Yugoslavians quote persecuted Italians unquote during World War II. One contemporary fascist said quote, today like yesterday, the worst racism is the ideological racism against Italians. Yesterday, it was in favor of Stalin and Tito. Today, against the Italians who ask for controls on immigration and the Islamic threat. Unquote. David Broder says contemporary fascists continued this policy of, quote, national victimhood, unquote, with legislation targeting those who questioned the Foy massacres. They deemed those who denied the Foyb killings to be as blasphemous as those who deny the Holocaust. While Italy recognized the Holocaust and even apologized for its role in it, they still refused to apologize for the hundreds of thousands of Slavic, Somali, Ethiopian, Russian, Ukrainian, and Spanish people the Italian state killed. What makes this more irresponsible? is that many of those killed in the Foyb massacres were fascist guards who were found guilty of their crimes prior to their execution. There's no question that ethnic Italians who had nothing to do with fascism were wrongfully targeted by Yugoslavian partisans. But it's generally agreed upon, even by Italian historians, that the Foyb massacres were spontaneous outbursts of violence, which continued because the entire countryside was in a state of anarchy because of Italian fascist rule. On top of this, many of those killed were Slavic fascist collaborators. This immediately disproves the Italian state's historical narrative that the Foyb massacres were a, quote, ethnic cleansing of Italians, unquote. 
David Broder concludes, quote, The Italian state's position establishes an equivalence between groups. The Italians killed in the FOIB and Jews murdered at Auschwitz. Regardless of who they were, why they were killed, and indeed whether or not their political action contributed to their deaths, unquote. One of the most disrespectful parts of this legislation was that it allowed families to be granted medals of valor only if their fallen relatives served in the Italian armed forces. This unsurprisingly barred all former partisans from receiving their medals. This was all done to reinvent Mussolini's regime in a different light. The Salo Republic wasn't a corruption-written German puppet state. It was just composed of a, quote, different kind of patriot, unquote. The Slavic and Italian partisans were no longer fighting for freedom. Instead, they fought on a, quote, wave of hate and bloodthirsty fury, unquote. This all helped to radicalize an electorate which was crippled by the 2008 financial crisis. More and more people turned to the far right. In October 2021, the headquarters of the largest trade union in Italy were attacked by violent fascists who were upset that they needed vaccine passes. When anti-fascists gathered in their hundreds of thousands to protest the violent attack, news reporters belittled them. They claimed that the term fascism was being, quote, overused, unquote. One anchor said, quote, if you tell your daughter to come home at 1130, not midnight, you are a fascist, unquote. Fascists had retained intellectuals in their ranks since the 1990s. Most famously, Renzo Di Felice, a world-renowned historian, released a 7,000-page book on Mussolini, which attempted to offer a more quote-unquote neutral view of the Duce. Somehow, in this 7,000-page book, Di Felice never once mentions the gassing of Ethiopian children, but he sure did manage to recreate a minute-by-minute -minute average day of Mussolini's. Almost a hundred years after World War II, the scars of the conflict have yet to heal. Many old wounds are being reopened. In the end, history is not some black and white reality in which people are morally correct just because they say so because they're in power. Alberto S. Sorosa claims the crimes of the fascists and the crimes of the partisans were not in any way comparable. Quote, Behind the most honest, good faith, idealistic fighter in a fascist militia were the roundups, the torture chambers, deportations, the Holocaust. Behind the most ignorant, thieving, cutthroat partisan was the struggle for a peaceful and democratic society. Unquote. When asked to offer some kind of apology for historical fascism and Italy's role in human suffering, Giorgia Maloney quickly deflects and mentions those who were killed by anti fascists. There are several modern day martyrs for quote unquote post fascism. The most famous was the death of Sergio Ramelli, who was killed for no reason other than for his far-right politics. Another favorite tactic employed by fascists is claiming that, quote, history itself, unquote, has freed the far-right in Italy. They claim democracy was being wasted, quote, on one side, unquote. Maloney also claimed a vast conspiracy was afoot. She said, quote, globalists... Unquote, were hatching, quote, a plan for the ethnic substitution of Italians and a supposed plan for the ethnic substitution of white Europeans with African and or Muslim peoples, unquote. This will somehow lead to the, quote, extinction of Italians, unquote. This theory is quite unhinged, and again, it's presented without any tangible or systemic evidence supporting the claim. White Europeans aren't being replaced. They just aren't having kids anymore because the world is burning. White politicians and judges are so terrified that this is the case that they are actively trying to employ policy which will force white women to give birth to more children. This thought process has inspired numerous terrorist attacks. In Australia, the shooter who killed 51 people at a mosque 
cited Luca Traini as one of his inspirations. Traini was a former council member for the Northern League. After hearing about the murder of a teenage Italian girl, he went on a shooting spree targeting African people specifically. Police found him draped in an Italian flag, performing a fascist salute. Maloney drapes her, quote, ideological struggle, unquote, in fantastical terms, regularly calling upon J.R.R. Tolkien's classic fantasy novel, Lord of the Rings, in order to compare the Italian state to Gondor, herself to Lord Faramir, and Europe to the long-lost men of Numenor. Her favorite line is spoken by Lord Faramir when he says, quote, War must be, while we defend our lives against a destroyer who would devour all. But I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend, the city of the men of Numenor, unquote. She said, quote, Today, like yesterday, the foreigner will not pass. One hundred years on, we remember sacrifice by fighting the same battle against fresh invaders, unquote. In both quotes, she asserts a state of war exists between African and Muslim people and Italy. During the second tirade, she made a point to decry George Soros and his support of migrant NGOs, while also lambasting a plan in Parliament which would naturalize any child born in Italy as an Italian citizen. In one of her most putrid displays of anti-migrant sentiment, she posted a video of an Italian woman being raped by someone who happened to be a migrant and used this poor woman's plight in order to justify her disturbing views. While using high fantasy to justify her low racism, she also uses modern culture and the fact that she is a woman to garner support from a younger audience who otherwise would likely not align with her politics. She uses song lyrics from Maroon 5 in her speeches, promising, quote, I'll carry these torches for you that you know I'll never drop, unquote a reference to her party's logo, a burning torch. This torch is claimed to represent, quote, 70 years of the democratic right, unquote, in Italy. However, others postulate the torch is a symbol for the blaze of fascism, specifically the pyre which remains lit around Mussolini's grave. Giorgia Maloni has repeatedly praised Mussolini, most famously. She said, quote, Mussolini was a good politician, in that everything he did, he did for Italy, unquote. Today, she has claimed Italian fascism has been, quote, relegated to the pages of history, unquote. But when she rails against LGBT lobbies, anti-fascists, and anyone else who might disagree with her, I can't help but think she's lying. Once in power, the racist rhetoric of Maloney's far-right Fratelli d'Italia political party translated itself into legislation. Migration policy in Italy has become draconian, to say the least. Italian authorities have mandated the expansion of, quote, detention facilities, unquote, for thousands of migrants arriving from Western and Northern Africa. Beyond this, they've made it much more difficult for NGOs to operate rescue vessels in the Mediterranean, in several instances, squadrons of the Italian Navy have captured migrant NGO rescue vessels, while also mandating that migrants should be sent to countries who support the same NGOs. If this sounds familiar, it's because the Republican Party in our own country is doing the same exact thing, shipping migrants to Martha's Vineyard on packed buses. Unsurprisingly, members of the far right in Italy glorify republicanism in the United States. What happens next for Italy is anyone's guess. It would be irresponsible as a historian to assume what could happen in the future for any state. In many ways, Italy was an altogether new experiment in nationalism, which managed to form in the fires of the mid-19th century. In other ways, Italy is an ever-repeating example of the struggle of an oppressed people attempting to cast off years of subjugation from neighbors and pretenders alike. The truth of Italy lies somewhere in the middle. 
There were great strides in the sciences, literature, and art. But there was also intense violence, war, and corruption. Both sets of virtues and vices exist in all governments because they exist in all people. Italian history is no exception. It was filled with heroes, villains, clowns, and geniuses with various worldviews and dramatically different upbringings. There were the great men of history who were all remembered fondly. And then there were the unnamed soldiers, nurses, and working peoples who made Italy a nation for better or worse. Italy may still be divided in many ways. There are a few countries in the world which aren't. Italians struggled to form a nation in the face of cultural assimilation and Austrian, French, and papal violence. Throughout the 19th century, Italians attempted and often failed to see their nation become free. Their sacrifice was not in vain, but in many ways, the same beliefs which Risorgimento patriots fought and died for were upended when Italy became a unified country. In place of idealism, the reality of taxation, corruption, and disease were laid bare. Italy joined the First World War to assert itself and found itself more downcast than ever, in the face of ambivalent allies and violent upheavals at home. Brought in to save the fledgling state was the strong man, Benito Mussolini. He proved definitively that fascist governments are abject failures on the world stage, which eventually implode or explode. Yet his ideas remained in vogue amongst the select few who remembered the, quote, good old days, unquote. So, just as Mussolini used the Roman Empire as a point in history to emulate, so now does Giorgia Maloney see the Mussolini era as the epitome of political success. So how do we stop that? Some believe that through derision and laughter, tyranny can be overcome. Others claim that by defeating fascists in the marketplace of ideas, we will slowly convert them to a less abhorrent way of thinking. In both cases, little progress is made. Maloney was only able to rise to power because the previous government refused to act. Trump was able to win the 2016 presidential election because the promises of the past 30 years made by the Democratic Party had not been fulfilled. America and Italy are wasting away because of the lack of follow-through and courage of moderate liberal governments which don't wish to rock the boat. I believe the time for hoping for a solution from the center is over. They have proven unable or incapable of fixing the problems which affect their people. In closing, I would like to read you the poem Be Moderate by the Irish nationalist James Connolly. Quote, Some men, faint-hearted, ever seek our program to retouch and will insist, whene'er they speak, that we demand too much. "'Tis passing strange, yet I declare, such statements give me mirth. For our demands most moderate are, we only want the earth. Be moderate, the trimmers cry, who dread the tyrant's thunder. You ask too much, and people fly from you aghast in wonder. "'Tis passing strange, for I declare such statements give me mirth. For our demands most moderate are, we only want the earth. Our masters, all a godly crew, whose hearts throb for the poor, their sympathies assure us too if our demands were fewer. Most generous souls, but please observe, what they enjoy from birth is all we ever had the nerve to ask, that is, the earth. Unquote. Today, Italy is no longer a kingdom, but a republic. In that sense, it is closer to the idealized version of Italy of which some of its founders dreamt. Unfortunately, the same problems which have always plagued Italy continue to plague it now. These include the church, misogyny, and a deep sense of insecurity over what being an Italian means. Ever since Diazeglio claimed Italians had not been made, the overwhelming quest for the Italians throughout history has been to create this tangible being and enforce that mold onto all people who live inside Italy. Perhaps instead of asking what makes Italians, we should be asking how to make Italy work for all the many peoples who live there. Throughout its history, 
Italy has played the role of a great stopgap between North and South, East and West. It contains traditions, histories, and cultures from all of these regions. Lombardy is named after the Germanic tribe which conquered and displaced the peoples originally living there. Cities in Sicily have Greek or Arab names, while much of southern Italy traces its cultural identity to the Iberian Peninsula. Even the religion of Catholicism was first practiced by peoples in the Levant before being transplanted to the Western Roman Empire. Regardless, the ghosts of yesterday will likely haunt the Italian people forever, or at least until they decide that being good to our fellow people is more important than a national or personal identity. Thank you all so much for listening. I'm your host, Joseph Pascone. I hope you've enjoyed this series of Turning Tides and this deep dive into Italian history. Before any of you ask, if I live that long, I will be covering the next 100 years of Italian history in the same depth in the year 2096. Until then, I hope you'll join me for our next series, where we will be returning to the pristine beaches of Puerto Rico. To hear how the American government was responsible for the sterilization of tens of thousands of Puerto Rican women, the irradiation of a man and the spread of economic monopolies throughout the Caribbean and Latin America, you'll have to wait for the next episode of Turning Tides. Una mattina mi son sligato Bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao Una mattina mi son sligato E trovato l'evanzio O partigiano Portami via, oh, bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 partigiano, portami via, che mi sento di morire, oh, sei un muoio di partigiano, un oh, bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 sei un muoio di partigiano, tu mi devi seppellire, seppellire la sua montagna. Bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 se perire e sui montagna, sotto l'ombre di un bel fior, e te le genti che passeranno, bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 te le genti che passeranno, te diramo che bel fior, e questi fiori di partigiano. Bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 questi fiori partigiano, morto per la libertà, e questi fiori di partigiano, morto per la libertà. If you like what you heard today, You can support us by donating on PayPal at Turning Tides Podcast One. Thanks for the support and thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, we'd really appreciate it if you take the time to rate and review Turning Tides on whatever platform you use to listen and share the show on social media. It really helps us to bring the show to more listeners. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to everyone for listening. We'd also like to say thank you to Movo Photo. We use their sound equipment for this podcast, as well as all of our other projects at Antics Entertainment. They make great equipment at great prices, and we really appreciate that they make content creating so accessible for indie creators like us. Check them out on social media at Movo Photo, M-O-V-O-P-H-O-T-O. Thank you again.